Hello. My name's Anita Stumpke. I'm a professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, I teach taught law, and I've taught taught law for many years um, alongside other subjects. Um, one of the things I think that's important to acknowledge in the learning of law is that it can be fun. And too often it's something that law students either aren't taught or they're convinced is not the case. So the aim of Zautonomy is to make law accessible and interesting, friendly for students. It's a very good question. The tort of privacy, one could say, has not gone at all. Um, there has been some recognition by the High Court in Lena Game Meads um, that there is the, the possibility, perhaps, of a tort of privacy. But of course, um, much of the commentary in that case was bouncing off the notion of attaching privacy to concepts that already exist in tort law, such as trespass to land. Um, we have had a few small murmurings um, in the District Court of Queensland and most recently in the New South Wales Supreme Court. Um, however, I would venture to say that the tort of privacy is not going at all in terms of the common law. Um, in terms of statute developments, we have had the Australian Law Reform Commission, which of course has recommended some um, legislative change in relation to privacy. Uh, whether or not the federal government has the will or the way to do that seems somewhat doubtful at present, um, but perhaps in the future. Uh, the future is always exciting with respect to tort law. I mean, the genius of the common law of torts is that it does develop and adapt uh, and also recognise that, that change is necessary in society and that law should accommodate it. So I would say never say never, but at the moment it's not going at all. The Strong and Woolworths decision has been handed down recently. Uh, in terms of the impact it has on negligence, I don't think our expectations were met by reality. Our expectations were that that particular case would resolve many of the issues that we have outstanding with respect to how the New South Wales Civil Liability Act, in terms of the tort law reform legislation, and by implication the other jurisdictions tort law reform legislation would play out with respect to causation. So we had big hopes for, for Strong. We, we thought that what it might resolve is how courts will approach factual causation, and in particular in terms of the New South Wales legislation, how the court would approach the interpretation of the words a necessary condition in Section 5C of the Civil Liability Act. I mean, in some ways we shouldn't be surprised because the outcome was appropriate. What the court basically said was that a necessary condition means that um, if you slip on a hot chip in Woolworths and there hasn't been adequate cleaning in terms of the time frames available, um, then the failure to clean is a necessary condition of the fall. In other words, it's, it's a confirmation, if you like, that there's a statutory formulation now of the but-for test. What we were hoping is that the High Court might resolve the issue of what happens if you have more than one contributing cause. Um, I'm saying we shouldn't be surprised because really there was only one cause in that case. Um, there was the slip on the chip. Um, if there had been more than just a slip on the chip, uh, then we would have had our questions answered. But we have to wait again. So what has it said about negligence? It's clarified, I think, what happens in slip and fall cases outside supermarkets and how often areas should be cleaned. Um, but for those of us keenly interested in the interpretation of the Civil Liability Act, it didn't quite get where we wanted it to be. I do not think that that particular tort is outdated. Um, if anything, the importance of statute is increasing and I think that in, with respect to tort law and the infringement on tort law uh, by statutes, and I'm talking about a variety of statutes, um, that that particular tort maintains its, its relevance. Now that said, of course it only operates well in particular areas. Um, and of course it depends, I guess, whose side you're looking at it from as to whether or not it's operating well. So there's a lot of justifications to that comment, but it is definitely still an important action in tort in terms of negligence law. It's an interesting question as to whether or not judges always assert their beliefs into law. Um, Indeed, we could write uh, many books and perhaps point to many examples in other areas apart from negligence where we might say that judges cannot divorce any of their particular opinions from the case in front of them. So I guess at my most general, I'd have to answer that question that, well, statutory 
a breach of statutory duty is a cause of action like any other allows a judge um, to be as black letter or perhaps as liberal as their individual approach allows them with respect to um, conditions of precedent, etc. So I can't really point to any, any case that would support that particular assertion, but nor can I deny it. I think the top error for both assignments and exams, in torts and perhaps every other subject, is the fact that students don't take the time to fully read and digest the question and fail to assess what it is they're being asked to do with respect to that question. So for instance, this is where the words such as describe, analyse, assess, critique uh, become important. And they become important in terms of a student understanding exactly what it is that they're being requested to do. Now, one of the luxuries you have in an assignment as opposed to an exam in answering your question is reframing it somewhat, particularly if it's an essay question. Um, you could, for example, use a footnote or use your introductory paragraph to, to give some idea as to what you have appreciated the parameters of the question to be. Now, that doesn't mean you can rewrite the question. I have seen attempts at that. Um, it's a very good technique, but it's not one that works. So you can't write your way out of a question, if you like. Um, but you can definitely phrase what it is you believe the question to be. Um, and that's important, I think, because, I mean, academics, the people who set the questions, are human as well. And it is possible that they have set a question with ambiguity. Now, I would always, uh, I mean, if you've got the time, you should always see your academic or ask them a question to try and clarify it. But if that's not possible, that's what I'd suggest you do. In terms of exams, Misunderstanding the question can be fatal because there's no time to save yourself. There's no one to ask. Um, so the most important thing there, I think, in terms of trying to avoid uh, problems is to make sure that before you go into the exam room, you're calm, um, that you have focus on the fact that you need to answer a particular question and read it well and devote some time to that. The second most common mistake I think in relation to assignments and exams um, would be again that issue of time and again that's not particular to torts. So it's more obvious in an exam. Um, I have marked some wonderful question ones in an exam paper only to open up an empty exam question two booklet. Now if there's only two questions in the exam it means you're being marked out of half the exam mark. Um, so lack of time allocation is just so critical and it seems so obvious but it is a really very common mistake. And similarly I think it's the same thing with assignments. I think we all have a reluctance to begin things that we think might not be pleasant. We all think that the due date is weeks and weeks and months away and we don't have to start it until perhaps a few days before. Um, and then when we realise that it's actually more difficult than what we thought it was, we start to panic. And that's when things like plagiarism, um, poor writing, all those things come in. So I think time allocation is incredibly important, both in assignments and exams. And in terms of torts in particular, I think the third probably most common mistake is that students don't recognise that torts in a lot of ways is a, as much as it's an interesting theoretical discipline, it's also very simple to structure and to understand. So you can actually divide up concepts in torts, for example negligence, you can take negligence and divide it into its categories and divide it into its subcategories. So my tip there would be to go back to your subject outline, look at how the people who have set the subject up have created and structured the program and create your work around what their expectations are. In terms of exam preparation, I think the first thing you need to be clear on is what the exam contains in terms of what style of questions being asked. That has an important bearing on how you prepare. Now that said, it actually doesn't change the fundamentals of what you do in terms of your preparation. In law, one of the most important things to have and to be correct about are case notes. To understand what a case is, you need to have succinct summaries, the facts, the issue, the ratio, the decision. Now the twist with torts, of course, is that in each jurisdiction, the tort law reform legislation now modifies what is the major tort that most subjects would cover, which is negligence. What I suggest to my students, and whether or not they follow this advice, I'll probably never know, um, but what I suggest is that they start with a clean copy of the relevant legislation that they have for their jurisdiction. And next to each section, if they can, and if it's an open book exam, 
you could just write in what is the relevant case name and that could feed into, if it's an open book exam, another document that has smallish case notes. Now if it's a closed book exam, again you have a different technique that you might involve, which might involve more, more memorisation of particular material. But for torts, that's what I'd recommend. Something that's short, that's pithy, that's sweet, um, but yet that jiggles your memory in relation to why it is that a particular case is important. And I think, if you like, my mind map through negligence as the largest torts would be the relevant piece of tort law reform legislation. Torts is so interesting and so fun that none of the concepts are challenging in a negative way. They're only ever all embracing and, and like a warm bath that's washing all over you. So let's go for our first warm bath. Um, I think causation is one of the most challenging areas in terms of um, the difficulty that it presents. And that's not just the difficulty in terms of the uncertainty that we have now that we have legislation in relation to causation and negligence and uncertainty attaching to how we interpret the words in that legislation, but also uncertainty as to how far the common law interacts with that legislation and the different common law tests that exists that exist either outside or inside of the legislative framework. Um, common law tests in the area of causation are traditionally difficult, they're evolving, um, they are challenging because you're talking about concepts that while they're factual concepts, and I'm talking mainly about factual causation, while they're factual concepts, they're very difficult for us to try to judge according to legal tests. So I think if you're feeling uncomfortable about causation, I think that's probably a good sign. You shouldn't be worried about that. And I think if you're feeling um, worried about it, then feel happy that you're worried about it because it will probably be in any exam that ever gets set in the area of tort law. So causation would be my first choice. And then following up on that, I think perhaps more broadly, is just getting your idea, oh, getting the idea that the tort law is something that can be broken up and it's digestible. So rather than looking at it as a whole, thinking of it as a huge subject area that has many different torts in it, if you break it up um, and itemise things and think about the structures within it, I think that you'll find, while still challenging, it's somewhat easier.